I'll start again. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Closing the Climate Gap, How Gender Equality is Key to Our Climate Future. My name is Amanda colson Drasner from the Environment Department at Deutsche Welle. Thank you so much for joining today. Today's event is organized in the framework of International Women's Day 2022 by the city of Bonn as part of their series on the topics of UN Bonn, along with the network Gender at International Bonn, in partnership with the Center for Green Growth in Ghana. Today, we'll hear from Katia Döner, who's the mayor of Bonn, Ursula Zauter, the vice chair of UN Women Germany, UN Climate Change Director of Communications and Engagement, Ina Parvanova. Also on our panel are Dr. Aviles Iraula, gender, chair of the gender group at the Center for Development Research of the University of Bonn, Stephanie Iram Akruma, Director of Project Development and Socioeconomic Impact at the Center for Green Growth in Ghana, and Fiona Marker, board member of German Watch and member of Students for Future. These knowledgeable panelists are going to speak on different aspects of our title topic, and we'll learn about the importance of gender equality to building resilient climate adaptation and how acting on climate change can advance the status of women and gender diverse people around the world. We'll hear first from the panelists and then open up the conversation for a round of questions from the audience, followed by some closing remarks on how we can move forward. If you have a question for our panelists or a comment, please use the chat function, which you can find at the bottom of the screen. And for everyone's information, this session will be recorded as you probably just heard, and some photos might be taken throughout. The recording will be available afterwards on YouTube, next week, and we'll post a link to that channel in the chat at the end of the panel. And with the housekeeping out of the way, I'm very happy to introduce Mayor Derner on behalf of the network Gender at International Bond. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, a very warm welcome to Bond's International Women's Day 2022 program and to this international panel hosted by the network Gender at International Bonn. I am proud that Bonn is a founding member of this network, along with the state of Northern Rhine-Westphalia, UN Bonn, UN Women Germany, GIZ and Deutsche Welle. We are all united in our efforts to advance gender equality. When we decided on this panel on gender and climate change, no one would have foreseen what was going to happen in Ukraine these days. Our hearts are with the people there, in particular with the most vulnerable women and children. I think I speak for everyone when I convey our wishes for peace and our solidarity from Bonn to Ukraine. Like many crises and conflicts of our days, this terrible war has a strong climate and energy dimension. I would like to encourage my fellow panelists to address this dimension and the link to our topic where they deem it appropriate. Our panel, Clothing the Climate Gap, how gender equality is key to our climate future, shall foster a debate between decision and policymakers, researchers, practitioners and civil society activists. And I have to admit that today I'm sitting here with several hats on. Firstly, I join you in my capacity as mayor of Bonn, a city on the way to climate neutrality with a good progress in gender equality, but we still have a gender care gap, which I'm determined to help bridge as well as a gender pay gap. My second hat is that of co-chair climate action with ECLI Local Governments for Sustainability, pursuing climate neutrality as well as equity pathways towards sustainable urban development. And thirdly, I'm here as a fervent activist for good climate policies and gender equal societies. With all these hats on, I can't help asking myself one thing, why? with half of the world's population being women, is this 50% still considered to be a minority? Perhaps because they are the power minority or the money minority, and they are clearly a minority when it comes to receiving the appreciation they deserve. Another explanation, women belong to less fortunate majorities in many contexts. They are the majority of caregivers, a majority of cheaper labor, and a majority impacted by global change, by violence, conflicts, and wars, 
as we are shocked to witness in Ukraine right now. Women don't desire to become the majority. They deserve equity in their representation and recognition. They deserve to be admitted to the circles of decision-making, to be acknowledged and paid for their valuable contributions at all levels. This includes caregiving on the one hand and rocket science on the other, just to name a man's club of tradition. Women also deserve to be equally sheltered from the impacts of climate change, to be equally empowered, entitled and challenged to bring solutions to the table. Here lies huge potential for gender equity and for our climate future allied from local to global. This shift is more urgent than ever, and it bears more potential than ever. Women are climate activists, like in our very own Born for Future process towards climate neutrality. Women are climate leaders, mayors and heads of states. Women are driving innovation and finding solutions. They run small scale farming irrigation projects or co-chair the IPCC, whose last report filled me with great concern. We would have never thought that anything good could come from COVID and yet building back better has resulted in plenty of good initiatives beneficial for economic recovery and for social and environmental goals alike. So now it is time to do a better job of mainstreaming climate action and gender equity in a way that multiplies the effects of what we undertake. On this path, we may not exclude nor must we cause conflicts between climate action and gender equity. We will simply try to bring about the best of both goals and to do so in a just and fair way. This is one of the messages that I as a mayor and the network Gender at International Bond stands for. So let's take the next one and a half hour to share our ideas and visions to be bold and ambitious towards a gender equal, better climate future for all of us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mayor Derner. Um, for some background on the intersection of these really important topics, gender issues, climate change, building, building resilience. Um, now we're going to hear from Dr. Ursula Zauta. She is the vice chair of UN Women Germany. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how gender and climate issues intersect and how can improving gender equity be beneficial to climate action and vice versa? Yeah, uh, Amanda, of course, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Dear Katja, dear co-panelists, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, dear audience, that goes for you as well. I've just checked. I would say that 99% of our audience are female. So <clears throat> we're preaching to the choir, but I think that's just what happens. Anyway, uh, how do gender and climate issues intersect? I'll give you a little example. I have a um, foster daughter and she's from a small village in rural Eritrea. Before she left, every Saturday she and her twin sister would be sent to a neighbouring village that was about five kilometres away to get water for doing the laundry. So they would queue up, fill the tanks, uh, put them on the donkey and walk back. Whenever water got scarce due to fewer rainfalls, that well would be overcrowded, so they had to walk even farther. They also gathered the firewood for the household, and when the summers were hotter and the trees were stunted, they had to track even farther to get that wood. The family grew sorghum, and when there was less rain, there would be a smaller crop and less money for food and commodities, and as a result, she and her sisters and her mother would get less to eat because the boys would be fed first and also better. So this is just, these are just two examples for the many ways, the myriad ways in which women and girls in the global south in particular are impacted by the climate crisis. In fact, how they are more impacted than men and boys. Why is that so? Because the climate crisis, just as the COVID pandemic exacerbates existing gender inequalities and puts women at risk. So I'll be a little bit more specific and give you a couple of examples. Um, in many regions in the world, men, women do most of the agricultural work. That's especially in Asia, 
um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East and North Africa. Estimates for Africa, for instance, suggest that although rural women own less than 10%, 10 to 20% of the land, they produce up to 60 or 80% of the food. But they have less access to um, agro-technology, to credit, to education on new technologies, all of which generally results in lower yields, even when the weather is good. So and women also carry a disproportionate burden, if you will, for harvesting water and fuel. Think of my foster daughter. And they rely heavily on natural resources for their livelihoods. Um, plus, they bear unequal responsibility for household food security. And if extreme weather patterns and natural disasters hit and resources become scarcer, the men can leave to find paid work, but the women can't because they have to stay on to take care of their families and, um, and the sick and the elderly and all the other things they have to do without any chance to earn additional income by paid labor or by selling some of their produce because there's not going to be enough of it. Women and girls are often second place in many communities when it comes to food um, and money becoming scarce then they are the first to suffer not only in regard to food again I refer you back to Hewitt, my foster daughter but also to schooling and um, to healthcare. So that's particularly pernicious in regard to sexual and reproductive health, which of course affects birth rates and maternal death, which of course ties back into lower educational standards, which of course ties back into um, less knowledge about hygiene and physical well-being. Um, natural disasters this is another example. Women are often more affected by natural disasters such as floods or um, drought. Their mortality rate is a scary four time, 14 times higher in these contexts. Um, just one example, the 2004 tsunami um, had 70% of female casualties. And the reason are very simple. The women are often discouraged from learning coping strategies and life-saving skills, such as climbing trees and swimming and gendered cultural codes, um, I think you could call them regarding dress, further inhibit their mobility. Uh, and now we come to an issue that goes for wars as well. The current one included um, climate related hazards are responsible for displacing about 21 million people every year. The UN estimates that about 80% of these displaced people are women. Um, and like wars, climate disasters increase the risk of gender-based um, violence. I just heard today that um, it is feared that many of the women and girls who've come over from Ukraine will be the target of, um, of gangs who will want to try to get them into uh, prostitution. Uh, child marriage is also another phenomenon that increases in times of war and uh, in, in times of uh, climate uh, crisis. It's all very weird because I think uh, women have long been associated with nature. Um, you know, all, you all know the saying Mother Earth. Um, we have been associated with the physical side of life, with nurturing. We've always been centered around human physical requirements, like eating, cleaning, um, taking care of the sick and elderly and children. Um, and, and this, plus the fact that women and girls bear the burden of climate impacts should really mean that uh, women have at least an equal say in climate decision making and action, that they should lead and drive change in climate adaptation, mitigation and solutions but they don't, and that has to change. Um, without the inclusion, as Mayor Derna said, uh, and that's a mantra of the of UN Women, without the inclusion of half of the world's population, it's unlikely that solutions for a sustainable planet and a gender equal world would be realized tomorrow. So I'm very happy that the world is now beginning to pay attention to all this, um, take this year's Commission on the Status of Women. The priority theme is, I have to read it because 
Uh, I can't wrap my, my head around it. It's achieving gender equality and the power of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk, reduction policies and progress. The motto is a shorter version of this and it's, it's very poignant. It's climate change and disaster reduction, gender equality at the center of solutions. This year's International Women's Day had also um, a topic or a, or a slogan that was focused on this gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. There's also the Action Coalition for Feminist Action for Climate Justice that was established at last year's um, Generation Equality Forum. And I'll just go into a couple of the commitments uh, that the Action Coalition uh, has given out and, and because they cover the major steps that should be taken towards gender equity in climate change. So that's increasing the use of data and statistics on gender equality and climate. That's essential, very importantly, the financing for gender just climate solutions. Think microcredits to women farmers and fisherwomen and funding for women led grassroots initiatives. Uh, which brings me to, to, to the second point. Why is it crucial to step up women's involvement in climate change and the attainment of the SDGs? It's just as important for the same reasons as their involvement in women peace and, in, in peace and security negotiations and politics are. Um, that's that's actually brings us perfectly to tie into our next um, our next panelist here. Am I am I am I over? Am I too old? I just, always am. I'm very sorry. Bit. I'm so I sorry to interrupt finished, you. <laughs> almost finished. I just wanted to give a couple of examples um, how we can improve things, but I'm sure that's all going to happen. <laughs> I'm so um, I'm so sorry others. to interrupt you. I just thought it was this is a perfect moment to tie into uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, the, well the done. policies. <laughs> Which we're gonna hear, um, which we're gonna hear next. Um, thank you so much for your contribution, Dr. Zauter. Um, that it's so important, and um, that example of your foster daughter is a really important illustration of um, a lot of these issues. Um, so now we're gonna hear a bit about how um, gender issues shape climate policies, and for that we're gonna hear from Ina Parvanova, who is the director of communications and engagement for UNFCCC. Um, so how do gender issues shape climate policies and also what role does the gender action plan play in this? Thank you, Amanda, and, and thank you to the Gender at International Bond Network for the invitation to join uh, this important discussion. Uh, Mayor Jurner and uh, my colleague Ursula Sutter provided a great uh, and clear overview of how gender and climate intersect and addressing one issue can benefit and support addressing the other. Uh, turning then to where can gender shape climate policies and the role of UNFCCC Gender Action Plan, it is critical to address gender equality and climate change holistically because they're in inextricably linked. Climate change is complex with many different aspects that are linked and connected. And so the responses and solutions to climate change must also be interlinked and interconnected rather than siloed. While gender is not only about women and girls, the differentiated impacts of climate change are gendered. Let me say that again. While gender is not only about women and girls, the differentiated impacts of climate change are gendered. And the institutions, businesses, and organizations where climate action decisions are taken have gender bias and inequality baked into their structures, built into their structures. Let me elaborate a bit. Women and girls are often impacted by climate change in different ways than men and boys, and in ways that increase vulnerability and decrease resilience. However, women and girls are not inherently more vulnerable to climate change. Their increased vulnerability is due to multidimensional factors not related to climate. Factors that are tied to historical and persistent discrimination in laws, customs, and norms that cause inequity and injustice. And this inequity and injustice is exacerbated by the impacts of climate change. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, it seems that your sound is kind of going out and in. Um, is there anything that, that happened? Um, no, unless the internet is kind of wavering a little bit. Um, is it better now? I can maybe sit closer to the mic. Yeah, maybe maybe that would maybe that would help. Thank you. Okay. 
and maybe speak louder. Okay, so as such, women and girls have access to information. When women and girls have access to information, financial and technical resources and autonomy, they can contribute as well as men to the solutions to climate change, just as they do in other aspects of government, business and society. Climate change affects all aspects of our economies and societies. Women and girls should be participating and represented equally, not only as a right, but also so that our economies and societies run effectively and fairly. In this critical decade of action, we need all climate action to be as effective as possible in order for us to meet the Paris Agreement goals. Climate policy and action can only be as effective as possible if we also advance the gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. We cannot reach the 1.5 degrees goal if we do not have all of humanity involved in addressing climate change. And that means we need more women and girls in all their diversity to be empowered and involved. Countries are increasingly recognizing these facts as evidenced in their nationally determined contributions or NDCs as we call them, the main climate plan required under the Paris Agreement. In 2020 and 2021, many countries updated and submitted new NDCs, new uh, nationally determined contributions. Although the overall result of the mitigation commitments was not sufficient to keep the world on track for the 1.5 degree pathway, it was encouraging to see that many more countries included references to how they're integrating gender into climate policies and plans. In fact, there was over 60% increase in the number of NDCs submitted that mentioned gender compared to the first submissions and over 16% of the updated or new NDCs included more elaboration, how gender was integrated. One other significant difference is that gender was included in developed country NDCs for the first time. Let's be clear, just as climate change is the concern for all countries, so is gender equality and the empowerment of women and girls. No country has gender equality fully sorted out. In our view, the number of countries and the depths to which gender is now integrated in NDCs is in large part thanks to the work that countries, organizations, and the Secretariat have undertaken under the UNFCCC Gender Action Plan. The Gender Action Plan was developed to accelerate gender integration in national climate policies and plans, as well as to achieve the goal of gender balance in climate decision making that parties to the UNFCCC set themselves in 2012. Activities under the action plan are grouped under five priority areas that were identified as key enablers for advancing gender equality, including gender responsive implementation and means of implementation, and that is finance, capacity building and technology development and transfer. Activities undertaken to date have included peer-to-peer -peer learning and sharing of experience at the regional and international level, on how to specifically integrate gender in different sectors relevant to NDCs and national adaptation plans. It's also involved capacity and skills building for national gender and climate change focal points, skills such as systems thinking and impactful communications and advocacy. This year, activities will include a special event to highlight the gender relevant aspects of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC's vital six assessment report. This includes data and information from the recently published IPCC Working Group 2 report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability, which reiterates earlier findings, namely that vulnerability to climate change is exacerbated by inequality and marginalization linked to intersecting factors such as gender, ethnicity, low income and other social and economic factors. Another activity this year, which speaks to some of those intersecting factors, is a joint event bringing together the members of the local communities and indigenous peoples platform, countries and organizations to workshop solutions for advancing the leadership of local communities and indigenous women's in, women in identifying ways of enhancing their effective participation in climate policy and action. We still have some way to go and more progress is needed urgently 
But I'm hopeful that those efforts will accelerate as countries and businesses come to realize that achieving gender equality is key to raising and achieving ambitious climate action. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. It's really interesting to hear how these different policy plans um, concretely affect how these issues are playing out around the world. I'm really hopeful that we'll see more, more and more climate policies incorporate these kinds of things um, as these issues get more and more important and they're talked about more. Um, they are still overshadowed in the climate debate, uh, but they're definitely more visible than they used to be. Um, and to hear a little bit about that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Avilis Araola, who joins us from the University of Bonn, where she chairs the gender group at the Center for Development Research. Um, what has changed in the last years in terms of academic research that has brought more of these issues to light, integrated them more into climate policies? And what are some of the remaining challenges that we still face in this area? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And I am feel very honored to be part of this panel. So I also thank very much to the organizers for this invitation. Uh, the question is not very easy to answer as academia is very broad and um, progress uh, is very touchy, let's say. And um, as I identify personally what are the um, advances and, and what are still the gaps in academia, I can mention four areas of um, a study, let's say, that have been very much into focus in academia in the last years. One of them is poverty and migration related uh, to climate change, where intersectionality and intersectional theories and um, intersectional approaches are very relevant. Uh, as I was mentioning, poverty and migration. The other, without doubt, is power, particularly the decolonial theory and practice uh, supported uh, particularly by the South, academics by the South, gender-based violence, and the fourth would be care work and stereotypes. These four areas came uh, under scrutiny by academic researchers worldwide, I would say, because of its, their importance, related to uh, climate-related risk. And something that I think it's very important to mention is uh, how academia itself is fighting its own internal goals, let's say. You know, academia has strengths, but also it's still being challenged internally by, by its own biases. As strengths, I can mention, of course, that uh, academia has a lot of influence by feminist currents, by activists, it, it has global support. The, by now, it's well established that experiences of women and men during and after times of climate-related crisis are different, and that their specific position in society influence their levels of vulnerability. You know? uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, is there any way that you could move a little bit closer to the mic or speak a little bit louder? It's just, it's very soft. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I'm really having some technical <laughs> challenges here. That's a bit I'm better. Not, yeah, okay, great. So I mentioned some strengths from academia in approaching these four topics, uh, but we also have the challenges, no? Uh, I think the challenge particularly of all science, uh, it's compartmentalized knowledge. And in this case, we are talking about gender that is considered separated from, from a climate uh, science, let's say, no? although it's increasingly recognized that they are connected, but the study can be still very much compartmentalized when we come to designing the, the research cycle, not the project cycle. Another one, of course, is the hierarchical knowledge. The hierarchical knowledge that um, uh, is uh, related to what researchers, researchers choose to study, what questions to respond, and to which people to ask. And we know in academia that, uh, yeah, for example, uh, going for biomass production uh, to replace fossil fuels, as an example, can 
put at risk food security and social protection for women. So by doing our research and having our results, we have to be very critical on what we are asking and for what purpose. No? Uh, we know that circulation of global knowledge is also very dominant in, in, in climate issues. Uh, a circulation of, of global no knowledge from the North particularly that minimizes uh, local wisdom and local experiences. No? Uh, just to put two examples of the internal challenges that academia is facing at this point. Uh, I'm going now more specifically, if I have a bit of time, to these four points that I mentioned. Uh, the issue of poverty and migration, for example. Um, we know that uh, climate futures don't look the same everywhere and for everybody, no? And this should be uh, central to any discussion regarding gender and climate uh, issues, no? Uh, we know that a climate future looks grimmer, for uh, example, for an old indigenous or black women in the rural areas of, of southern mm -hmm. countries. And we must be aware that uh, researchers have to be very attentive to the complex and intersecting power relations. No? So we are answerable for our efforts to resist simplifications and homogenizations and aggregations of women as one group. No, just as one group. We have to be very aware of that. So evidence is there of this difference, but we need to systematize it, to mainstream it, and to make a strong global case for it, no? for particular realities that need particular attention within climate action. Um, a second one would be um, area of focus in, in academia would be gender-based violence. No? As in other areas of development and human rights activists, gender-based violence has gained attention because of its pervasive and perverse effect, not only on the survivors, no, uh, health and well-being, but also to her, his participation in the economy and politics and his, her contributions to social life and to uh, climate action. When looking at environmental conflict, uh, gender violence, no, we have some research projects, for example, in Colombia, uh, at CEF showing that uh, women defending human and environmental rights face increasing violence due to intersecting forms of discrimination. A third area of, of, of interest and advance would be care work and, and stereotypes. Uh, where research has made important ad advances, uh, observing the evidence of the role of stereotypes in shaping policies, technology, and development itself. Uh, because of time, I will not go deeper on that. I uh, just mentioned also that besides the stereotypes, care work is also uh, very relevant, uh, mainly pushed by feminist economists. Uh, we know that unpaid labor uh, influences women's time poverty and limited access to decision-making spaces, no? Uh, but this is not to look at care work as undesirable work and unnecessary burden, but uh, particularly from knowledge from the South, we should look it as, uh, at care work as a valuable work, no? Of social reproduction. Uh, love for the others and for life itself that needs to be shared and valued instead of failing heavy on women's shoulders only. I'm um, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you again. Um, do you think we could just go through uh, your fourth point a little bit quickly, just so we have all the time for the other panelists? Thank you. Okay, thank you for giving me the chance. The last one is power, for sure. No, and in this, in power, I should mention uh, two aspects: the decolonization of knowledge. I already mentioned academia is also advancing on this area, uh, and the other one is uh, uh, the misappropriation of nature and its impact on climate-related crises. Not this cannot be solved only by looking at gender and climate gaps, but to historical power relations that continue to be based on unjust appropriation of resources and labor between a uh, north-south divide and a uh, powerful and less powerful divides within different countries. Perfect. 
Thank, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you you sharing all of that and going through all of those different points. Um, this is something, of course, that translates to um, work on the ground that um, is happening at the intersection of gender and climate. Um, and now we'll hear from Stephanie Iram Akuma, who works in this capacity as the Director of Project Development and Socioeconomic Impact at the Center for Green Growth in Ghana. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about how these things, these themes of the gender gap in adaptation and building resilience come together in your work? Thank you very much, Amanda, for the question. And thank you, everybody before me who has um, prepared the ground so that I can be able to share the practical things that are happening on the field. There's an old Chinese adage that says that women hold up half the sky and in our context, women, uh, the sky is uh, literally climate and the atmosphere. And if women hold up half the sky and then we, half of the population of the world is our women, how come we are not partaking on the field, on the ground, in the decision-making? So technically speaking, we need to get into these spaces. For us in the global south, if you hear any existing flood, existing drought, from Hurricane Kenya, from all country, every other existing flood related issue that we've had over the last few years, East African droughts that have been 2011, 2017, 2019, wiped out crops, wiped out livestock, it happened in the global south. South Asian floods happen in the global south. Dry corridors in Central America happen in the global south. Australian flood wildfires happen in the global south. Cyclones, Idea and Kenneth happen in the global south. For us here, the effect of the climate crisis is not the same as what happens in the global north. This is not to say that nothing is happening in the global north concerning adaptation and resilient building, that it, the effect is not being felt there. But all of us are actually affected here the most with these things. We've realized though that women suffer the most because there are already existing multilateral problems, gender-based violence, low employment payments, inability, women in agriculture that, that do not own lands, women that suffer from flood-related things, access and control of water. For instance, on the field, women are overrepresented in water collection, women are not however adequately represented in the governance, the building and the planning of the infrastructure around water. The difference in livelihoods, for instance, women cannot own land titles, like Esla mentioned earlier, but they, are, they farm the most, they, are, they take care of what 80% of most agriculture related farms are women controlled and women based. Gender based violence are existing because women become more vulnerable in, as a result of climate disasters. They cannot do the, they can't farm, they can't do anything. So they are dependent on their male partners in local communities. Women suffer different roles and care activities that's already been mentioned by other panelists. However, for instance, in Kenya, about 85% of women's daily intake of water, it's of time is spent on water about eight hours a day is there in search of water. In, there are different expectations for women and social norms on the field. Women in households cannot perform and are not able to make certain decisions concerning their individuality. For some uh, capacity building in, in Thailand, for instance, women in certain communities in Thailand, not only about Thailand, certain communities in Thailand, women are prevented from participating in trainings because the, the training requires that we spend one night out of the villages. So if you, if you plan a two-day training, you can't have certain women from certain parts of Thailand attending because they can't choose their mobility and their restrictions around their mobility. In some communities, for instance, in Sri Lanka, um, there's need to, women are, are more, less likely to survive from tsunamis than men are because the decision comes down to one, being able to be able to survive these things and being able to be able to move very freely, being able to swim, be able to have the necessary skills. Early marriage and dependency has also made it very difficult because you need to seek permission to involve women in trainings that even educates them about climate change adaptation and what they should do. So when these things happen, they are affected the most. So generally education and skill for women on community-based levels in projects, in administering climate-based adaptation, especially in the global south and some parts of Africa, is very difficult because of these things. And concerning research, the problem is that 
research and policy are not reaching the local levels. Financing is not even trickling, trickling down very effectively. There's all this glamorous research around what we are doing at COP. What happened at COP26? People are giving a lot of money. We are going to implement this. We are going to implement that. But when it comes down to it, even at the local, local grounds and local communities are not even involved in decision making. When they put the information together and they come in and they say, okay, this is what was we had agreed on the international levels, there's no proper way to administer it, even trying to put it to for make to make them understand these things, the policies that they need to implement. So there's a huge policy gap with everything that is happening on the global level, on the national level, and what is happening on the lower levels, on the grassroots levels. In as much as we have come far, we have to admit that from the beginning and the first, from the UNFCC, NFCC's first documentation and those agreements that existed, those were gender blind. But today we have seen that women have been included in negotiations, have been included in capacity building, have been included deliberately. But there's so much work to be done to be able to close the gap between policy, between research and what's actually happening on the ground. So I have some re recommendations that I have to, I can make as a result of what we do on the field and what we can be, do to enable policy to enhance implementation on the ground. We have to really consider a very gender responsive approach to adaptation. We have to understand that all the new uh, commitments of finances have to be able to tickle down with very good monitoring and evaluation policies. We have to understand that Momentum has to be built and political will has to be built deliberately, including women in decision making and indigenous people, so that we are not leaving them out of the conversation, we are including them. When the policy comes in place, they are the ones going to implement it. We have to fill the gaps that have to, that has to connect women to policy and implementation. We have to improve women's access to land, for instance. In the last COP26, Sierra Leone committed to addressing this long-standing dis uh, discrimination to land tenure practices. We have to apply the interconnected approach to problem solving. The very problem with climate, climate ad adaptation, climate mitigation, and women's participation is this is very simple. It cannot stand alone. The existing issues of gender-based violence, the existing issues of women, women employment and payment, the existing issues of women participation in the private sector. So once if you want to solve the issue of climate justice, everybody has mentioned that it has come to exacerbate the issue on gender and climate change has just come to exacerbate the existing conditions on women in the environment. So what we need to do fundamentally is this, apply more technologies and advanced access to women's courses, considering the various communities and the countries. When the decisions are made on the international level, they need to be contextualized on the local levels. Advocating for loss and damage and financing is for women because over here on the field, women do the work in agriculture, Food security is at risk because if women's participation are reduced, it's women who are doing this work on the field. So the advancing the courses to enable resilient, resilient building to, add, to gain adaptation finance, to be able to get recovery for loss and damage, is not just for the people in the global south, but because women are the most vulnerable in these places. So we need to advance such courses to be able to advance what and, and affect the local communities on these levels. Thank we you. Also have to, Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, we we really need to get to the to the last panelist in order to have some time for discussion. Very sorry to interrupt you there. Um, thank you, thank you very much for for sharing that. Um, what you have been talking about really ties into a lot of structural issues that we see um, not only in the global south but also around the world. Um, to speak to this, we'll hear from Fiona Marker, who's a board member of German Watch and member of Students for Future. Um, how do we go about working to not only be more inclusive, but also centering underrepresented voices in the climate debate? Um, first of all, I want to uh, say that as a white woman in the so-called Global North country, I am one of the least underrepresented groups among the underrepresented groups. Um, so. I'd like to repeat and amplify uh, what I've learned by mainly Indigenous and Black authors and educators about Indigenous and Black struggles. Um, for example, what's happening on Wet'suwet'en lands in Canada right now, where there's the gas link pipeline uh, built on Indigenous lands, despite Canada having uh, 
ratified the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as national law or at Standing Rock um, on Turtle Island or the USA, where the Standing Rock Sioux tribe has said that the Dakota Access Pipeline violates Article 2 of the Fort Laramie Treaty, which guarantees undisturbed use and occupation of the lands around the location of the Dakota Access Pipeline, which are the lands of the Standing Rock Sioux tribe. Um, we also know that these fossil fuel extraction sites um, lead directly to spikes in men's violence against particularly indigenous women and girls. And here we have another intersection of sexism, racism, capitalism, and an exploitative mindset. And I'd like to elaborate on that mindset because at least in the mainstream, it has not been comprehensively rooted up and it still informs thinking, learning and policy making. So um, a main point of this are the state theories of the so-called enlightenment um, theory. So power structures were manifested and formalized through these state theories. And what was done was that the human or mankind was separated from nature. And women and black and indigenous and people of color were put in the nature section rather than the human section. So just as man needed to dominate nature, man needed also to dominate women. And this is not taught in school. In school, we are still taught that, oh, the enlightenment theories were so great. And this is what uh, human rights are built on. So you only get information on that if you're already a bit suspicious. And this also is an eradication of everyone but the rich, white, cis, hetero men and the eradication of the working philosophies of marginalized people, which uh, usually are much more community centered, like the Ubuntu philosophy. And uh, in my admittedly short experience of the NGO scene, it's still built on that mindset because there was a failure to comprehensively root out this mindset. And there's either not, no, not much or no knowledge or consensus especially on the need to root it up or on the process on how to best root it up. And the formalized that is the, the NGOs are the harder it is usually. So um, while grassroots uh, NGOs usually don't have a set hierarchy, if you have a formalized NGO, there's a hierarchy, someone profits from it and it takes much more energy and time to change this mindset. And even if there's a consensus on changing that there's still way to go. For example, um, the NGOs Avas and Comeback who were tackling poverty, lost state funding and privileges because what they did was not considered to be in the interest of common good anymore. And um, not only do we need to uproot this mindset in the NGO scene, we especially need to uproot it in politics because we don't need any more annexes to uh, documents that say, oh, women are important too. Women cannot be an afterthought. Indigenous peoples cannot be an afterthought. Local peoples cannot be an afterthought. And so the vast majority of policymakers need to see and admit their short-sightedness because they never realized nor accepted that indigenous people's knowledge, local people's knowledge and women's knowledge are, is at least as vast and as valuable as the academic Western knowledge. And for fighting chance against the climate crisis, we need to disrupt and dismantle these old power structures and redistribute the power to indigenous, local, anti-racist and feminist perspectives. And uh, we also need to acknowledge that the so-called add women and stir approaches are not enough. We, you need to listen to women, you need to take us seriously and shape your policies accordingly. And I know that there are many commitments to provide training for women, to invest in women, and I don't have a vast experience in navigating, for example, UN documents, so correct me if I'm wrong. But I haven't found an effective sanctioning mechanism to ensure gender responsive actions. And we also do not need to train women's eco expertise. We also need to train men and especially on how sexist upbringing and socialization in the sexist society consciously or unconsciously informs thinking, actions and policy making. And the same goes for white people and racism and for every oppression structure and the group that profits from it. Because just like we need a just transition where we transfer power from fossil to renewable and re-educate people that are affected by that change, we need a redistribution of social power and the training for people socialized in these harmful systems on how to unlearn destructive and oppressive habits and actions and learn how to act in a respectful, responsible, healthy and just way. Then 
we can solve the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for sharing all of that. You packed a lot of stuff into um, a little bit of time. I really appreciate that. Um, so we're going to hear from the audience now, uh, and I see that we already have a few questions. Um, if you have any questions or comments for any of the panelists specifically or generally, um, please put them in the chat. And um, yes, would like to open it up to, uh, to a discussion. Amanda, perhaps I may bring in the first of the questions which I, which I read. I had an interesting question concerning uh, maternity death and the protection of women and children. Um, quoting the terrible incidents in Mariupol in Ukraine where uh, a hospital uh, was attacked. What can we do to better protect uh, mothers and children in this very vulnerable situation? in um, situations of climate crisis and natural disasters? That was one question from Sandra. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for mentioning that. Is there anybody who specifically wants to take this question? Um, any of our panelists? Dr. Lauter? Yeah, I think what we what we need to do is to um, make our, our disaster response policies more responsive to gender issues. Um, for instance, um, in the case of the Ukraine uh, war, about 80% of the people who are leaving the country are women. Um, they need different services uh, when they get to wherever they are going. Uh, they need different um, um, healthcare uh, services. Talk about pregnant women or women who have just given birth. Uh, they need protected accommodation. You can't put them in a big flat dormitory with a lot of men. Um, you need to give them uh, a protected space. Um, you need to, um, if you have the chance, you need to organize their exodus from wherever country they're coming from. Uh, um, you have to gear it to their needs, but that is very hard to do because like if we've just haven't seen two weeks of war and the response of people moving out has been so fast that it's very hard to, um, you know, put that in place. Really, you should say the women are the children and the, and the mothers to be are the first to leave the country. But how do you bring that message across? But at least at our side end of the, um, the whole um, disaster, we can, we can try to be gender um, specific. Um, we need to do that, um, including um, making uh, asylum seeking procedures uh, more gender sensitive. I'm thinking of um, the hearings you have at the BMF, which are not gender sensitive. I can tell you that. Um, it is just horrendous what goes on. Um, <sighs> It's hard to do that at the end where the war comes from. Of course, uh, when it's about climate change and women leave because of, um, because of climate change uh, effects, you can try to make their routes of uh, migration safer, but again, they're deemed to be the least important. So that is a conundrum. I don't actually know how that can be done in, 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 in the scene of crisis, but we can do it at our end. Maybe that's a bit of an answer. Yeah, thank you. That that was reminding me of um, something that Stephanie um, was saying about how um, women are more vulnerable to the effects of tsunamis. Um, have Have you seen anything or in your work on the ground that has been able to change this? So concerning women's vulnerability, as most panelists have already mentioned, it is mostly based on the interconnected of all the problems that exist at the moment. So women are already going through very vulnerable things when it comes to the agenda, because of the agenda, because of our agenda, there are differences in these things. For instance, the, there are some statistics that say that if we are going to survive the climate crisis without actually empowering women to be able to advance goals in terms of disaster and risk management on the ground, on the field, uh, the biggest issue we are likely to face 
is that even majority of children and young people will be able to adapt as well. Because when men are trained and men can, are able to have the skills and the education, the advancement to be able to do these things, it's difficult for women to be able to adapt equally without the same enabled skills, without the same issues around it. So when it comes to be, being able to develop policies, I'm going to link it back to the Ukrainian issue. When it comes to being able to develop certain things to mitigate the effects of the war on the persons migrating to other parts outside Ukraine, I think that what can really be very good is if they put certain training mechanisms in certain refugee camps or certain places when people migrate there, they are able to help, help them adapt initially so that they don't feel that their lives are almost over when they get to other people's countries or when they move to it. Also, I'll talk on inclusiveness and diversity in moving people because there were a lot of issues around how persons of color, how vulnerable people were being treated when they were moving and migrating to other parts outside Ukraine. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I think that there's also the need to consider that these are people are from different backgrounds, people that actually weren't Ukrainian, and women that actually don't come from there have different scopes. So every woman is not, every woman is not necessarily the same because we all face very different issues and if you come from somewhere else or some other part of the world certain vulnerabilities might affect you some people um, people who spend their life savings trying to send them to these countries to get educated so they can't just pull them out and they are very vulnerable to these issues so certain certain things need to be treated very differently when it comes to these issues and so in treating women that are leaving war prone areas or are leaving places there has to be consideration for the various backgrounds and where they are going and, she, and consider the specific thing that needs, they need help with and be able to access that their cultures are also very different and they can't be treated the same. It's not going to be able to help them advance better or advance in, in the best way possible. So there's a need to consider the difference in cultures, the difference in places they're coming from and help them assist them based on what they are used to. So it is easy for them to, um, to enter into new countries and feel safer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that that actually ties into another question that we had, but Susanna, I'll, I'll let you, um, I'll let you give us another question that you've found. Happy to, um, a very interesting um, researcher's question, also um, referring to Fiona, the mindset is contextual and cultural specific. How we can we address it through research? That is Renu asking. So how to, how to address a mindset um, through research? Yeah, so um, of course, that is a big question. Um, the mindset is contextualized, yes. Um, and we need to address it specifically for um, demographics or identity groups. So uh, I, as a white woman, have a different view than a black man. and. Um, I mean, we have, for example, uh, gender disaggregated data, but uh, on the mindset, um, I mean, those are certainly psychological um, effects and research, but also probably on how engaging with people can, can change that mindset and um, how, uh, for example, gender studies are very important to uh, academic academic research and um, I mean we do have research that, that that looks into it and I guess we will just have to apply that but this of course will not go over well with the people who currently hold the social power so um, I, I think that's that's the problem that we always have that that we we need to get get through a system that does not necessarily enable this research and this mindset change? I hope this answers the question a bit. Yes, thank you. Um, that actually ties in well to another question that we have um, and feel free to uh, add on or somebody else to take it. Um, how can we involve cis men, not only in climate justice, but also in gender equality topics? Um, and this also ties in nicely to what we've been speaking about how it's important to look at not only um, women but also everybody um, everybody in who's involved in these discussions. Um, I'm not sure I think Stephanie's hand was first. Sorry Dr. Zaja. 
Thank you. Um, I think if we want to change the mindset, which of course is still very male at the moment, we have to be ready to deliver dollar handles. We have to be ready to point out the profitability of putting women into the climate change equation. I'm just going to give you um, one example, which I love to quote. Um, we, were, we were talking about the 80%, 60 to 80% uh, female farmers. So if all these female small holders had equal access to productive and especially eco-friendly resources, their farm yields would be expected to rise by 20 to 30 percent per year. And that would mean that about 100 to 150 million people would go hungry no more. And um, better yields would also um, reduce the pressure to deforest land, which, of course, again, um, saves water and, and, and um, saves carbon emissions. So I think you have to give people concrete examples for why they should invest in, into these issues, because they're getting something out of it. I'm, it's sad that we have this. We should have an intrinsic uh, sense of justice that motivates us to, um, you know, create gender equality, but we don't have that yet. So that is something I think we, should, we, we need to do. We have to stress the, the advantages. Women are still very much focused on as, a, as victims, victims of climate change, victims of war. Um, that's the same discussion with people with handicaps. They're victims. Yes, of course they are, but we, we have to change the narrative. And, and UN Women has uh, the hashtag um, flip the script. So let's, let's do that. Um, and also what we need is the data. I'm a great fan of having data to put decisions on because if you have empirical data, if you can prove things to rational men, then you can actually do things. Otherwise they'll say, oh, you're just saying that, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, you're just imagining things. No, you need the data. Um, so I think I said that before, but I'll stress it again. Thank you. So Stephanie, would you like to add something? Yeah, so I'll contextualize it's on the ground. So the thing is this, um, men are still, a lot of leadership positions are still being held by men in the private sector, in governmental and in, in decision making in, in most places around here. And so if you are going to, like as I rightly said, you need, you need to tackle two things, knowledge and finances. If you can explain its profitability to them, it would work. If you can prove empirical data, it would work. You also need to understand that you, you need men's involvement in it, no matter what you do, because if, if they are not involved in the mindset and change, it's, it's problematic because most of the time, for instance, if you're using a, a local community, a family that everybody re reports to the father, the person whose mind you need to change there is possibly the woman, but she's not going to fight it. She's not going to fight it until the man, the man is actively involved. If he's not ready to give the last go ahead, he's not ready to say, I'm going to give out the land for this person to farm. The person doesn't own the land. So yes, there's need for empirical data. There's need for, to be able to convince people in the private sector and businesses that are a lot of male dominated areas that they need to get on board and change those mindsets. And also when it comes to the local communities here, we have issues like poverty. We have issues like food insecurity. If you are hungry, I'm not saying this is the typical case in Africa today, but think about this scenario. If your priority is food, if your priority is a job, if your priority is employment, would you give any priority to somebody that comes to talk about climate change? Or somebody that uh, comes to talk about gender and climate change? So there's also a need to consider that, yes, it is important that the finances follow it. So one of the things I am very active about here is green jobs. That is one of the ways I get through people. I say, this is going to provide you jobs. This is going to be able to help this problem. This is going to be, so for us here in this part of the world, you can't just sell the idea on climate change, gender and climate change without selling it back to poverty eradication and without selling it back to development. That is how mindset change works over here. I hope I've been able to help answer the question. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a definitely a very interesting and important um, contribution. Thank you. Um, Mayor Derner, I think I saw you raise your hand. Yes, I would like to um, add a practical approach to the question how we can involve 
people whose voices are not heard properly, um, an approach from the local level like Bonn. Um, Bonn had the goal to become climate neutral latest 2035. And we developed a cooperation with the city, um, with the um, cooperation with, um, no, I like the word, you need to help me. Civil society, I'm sorry, with the civil society um, to uh, develop uh, ideas together, which is called uh, Bond for Future. And usually if we invite citizens um, to develop ideas and to discuss uh, issues with the city administration, we just invite people to come. And that leads to the situation that in general, the same people who are involved and who uh, have a very strong mindset and who know a lot from uh, specific topics, they come to give advice to the city administration. And in, within this process, uh, Bond for Future, we now started to pick citizens from our citizens register at random and to bring these people together, like 100 people picked at random from the city register with a very different background. Um, and uh, I already attended um, one of the meetings and it was very interesting because we have a, a very diverse setting and a lot of people attended who I never saw in this um, climate discussion panels we usually have. And I think this is a very good way uh, that we developed at the moment to bring more people together and to make um, more voices heard who are usually not heard in a context like a, a climate crisis process and trying to advise the city administration. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that practical example that reminds me of um, the citizens assemblies on climate that are happening in different cities around the world, including Berlin very soon, which is very exciting. Um, we have um, another question here um, that I would very much like to direct to um, Ina Parvanova, um, which is what is an important link between climate and gender that is relevant for us in the global north? And what is something that we really have to act on um, um, urgently? Thank you, Amanda. Um, I hope to have addressed some of that already in, in the remarks that I gave. Um, but I want to give a chance to my colleague, Fleur Newman, who some of you already know. She's my alter ego here, uh, the other in the Parvanova as you, that you can see. So maybe Fleur, if uh, you want to take that one. Thank you, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased to be here and, and listening to, to all of the uh, discussion tonight. Um, I think one of the really important things uh, to, and I think that you know has already indicated that gender equality and, and women's and girls' empowerment is not um, is, is something which the global north still needs to do to deal with, and that there are intersecting. Uh, issues like um, income. So, you know, one area in the global north uh, where you might not sort of automatically think about it, but energy poverty is um, is gendered even in the global north. So, it's it's an area in which uh, policy needs to to take into account and 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 where gender equality and and dealing with um, poverty issues could be addressed through. Uh, through climate policy that that is taking us away from fossil fuels and and into a, other areas of of um, energy, so that's one area. But also, um, global north uh, countries have higher emissions than than uh, global south, most global south countries. So the decisions that are being made at the moment, I think the points being made that those decisions at the moment are being made by governments and companies that are predominantly uh, or male dominated. And so there's a real need for um, uh, more female and feminist voices in, in decisions of power in the global north as well. So just two examples, perhaps. Thank you. Um... 
alter ego. Um, someone I uh, just wanted to mention really, really briefly, we were talking about including uh, cis men in the discussion and there our audience is highly female, uh, which is very interesting. So if there are any men here, thank you very much for joining and listening to this. <laughs> um, so we have one more question here. Um, that is, how can we ensure 50-50 in COVID recovery, um, a Green New Deal and an equitable transition? Could you put that in the, uh, in the chat? Uh, yes. If that was a long question. Yes. Um, I think what is meant by this is um, there's these different aspects that we're trying to bring issues of gender equality into um, similarities between the COVID recovery, the Green New Deal, and an equitable transition to renewables. Um, I guess a lot of themes of this have already been mentioned, but if there's something that somebody feels has not been touched on, um, please feel free to share. Perhaps um, Dr. Aviles Arahula. Thank you. Uh, I'm not very sure about the question because as I see in the chat, it talks about 50-50 participation in, in government, meaning taxpayers, no? Uh, well, we at the Safe Gender Group um, discussed this issue of the COVID and, and the gender implications and also related to some climate issues. And uh, we, we discussed and it's obvious that the many dimensions of the COVID and how they are interlinked with um, gender inequalities are so obvious and so worsened by the, by the pandemic. So, uh, the answers uh, to many of the questions we have as society, including pandemics, seem to be uh, almost the same. You know? Change the hierarchical position of women in relation to men, uh, address the issues of gender-based violence that uh, have to do also with this COVID and, and, and the situation afterwards. And, um, uh, pay attention, pay very much attention to how uh, structural issues uh, such as care work, for example, are divided in our society, um, make some allies within the governments to really face these, these, these issues um, that are very structural because, I mean, COVID gives, gave us the opportunity to see the expression probably in its worst space of these structural problems. So it's not about making uh, superficial changes, but really looking once and again to the structural problems because these situations will be uh, repeated in the future if we don't look at them. You know? uh, I am saying this, I'm saying this in relation to, to this specific problem because I don't get it really, I cannot see really the question and what is, specifically about. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, Dr. Zauter? Um, I'm not quite sure I'm getting the question, but I'm gonna answer, <laughs> try to answer um, a little bit. We have made great advances in the inclusion of women in um, peace negotiations, post-conflict solution finding uh, through the Security Council resolution 1325 and all the follow-up um, resolutions because they are binding. So governments have to uh, report on what they've done to, to implement uh, changes. And there are shadow reports that, you know, take um, uh, a very critical view of those reports. Unfortunately, we, we can't do this um, with, for instance, equitable transition, COVID recovery, because it's not a Security Council issue. But um, I, I think we need more big policy. I mean, we've had some advances like with last year's Gender Equality Forum, but we, we have to pick up the momentum that has been created. Um, and, and we have to um, dis disperse more information. Um, 
yeah, well, I, I'm not sure that answers the question in any respect, but I, I said it anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Stephanie Akuma? Yes, I think that where the, the question may, I would take the question from is because what I see that underlines equitable tr transition, COVID recovery and the Green New Deal is jobs and financing. So I would see that maybe the question is trying to talk about how we can we sort of put all these together in tackling them as a, as a collective problem instead of acting that seeing them as an individualistic or we have to integrate and find that interconnectedness. So for instance, equitable transition and moving to green energy and even just transitioning and the COVID recovery for the COVID recovery for our part of the world has been immense because most economies are doing very poorly as a result of COVID-19. The 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 and trying to create green jobs and trying to transition and abide by certain emission policies, even though we have low emitters. So I think the idea around that is that you can't actually um, the, the way the problems are, uh, are interconnected, you can't sort of separate them in certain sense, which are, when it comes to COVID recovery, especially how economies on this part of the world are doing and just transitions and equitable transitions so that it doesn't affect and push more people into poverty. So I would consider that the question we try, what we, we need to probably say to answer this question is that most of the times when you're tackling these issues, they come together for us, our part of the world where a lot of the financing is dependent on aid and IF IMF and the likes and a few on taxes. Sometimes these things already come with some requirements to, to consider um, a, a COVID recovery strategy, to consider some elements of uh, green recovery and consider some equitable just recovery initiatives in using those finances to, to support the economy to go back to a normal economy. So for me, I think that the 50-50 may not always be possible. It depends on how much of a problem that the country specific is struggling from. And then whether or not they want to use whatever financing is available to do only COVID recovery or include something that has to do with just transition or include something that has to do with um, related to the green deals or anything that has to do with green jobs. That is how I think I understood the question. I hope I've been able to answer the person. I never think 50-50 is possible anywhere, but maybe based on the situation or the problem, some of it is considered. Thank you. Thank you. Um, May Adrena? Oops. Sorry, I'd just like to add, um, if we want to tackle these issues, 50-50, for example, COVID recovery, Green New Deal, and also um, climate crisis issues, um, I think that we definitely need more um, representation of women, 50-50 representation of women in decision making and decision making process and when it comes for example to uh, disaster and risk management and disaster and risk policy there are still almost no women in this field even not in the uh, committee of the German parliament now we have a minister for the interior a female minister uh, for the first time in a very long row the first one I think ever and I'm very curious to learn how she is going to uh, address uh, this kind of uh, issues. Um, but I think this is a very general and very deep rooted problem that we don't have female politicians and also in the administration, very few um, women tackling this kind of issues, especially in, in the field of disaster and risk management. And we need to uh, strange in women in decision-making processes in, I think, almost every country. And I think we need, also, we need laws and very strong rules to enhance female representation. Yeah, th thank you for mentioning that. That's a really important point. Uh, and also a very interesting one about the, the disaster and risk management. Um, we have another question, but as we only have 10 minutes left, um, it is about including these issues into education. Um, our final question for the panelists, and perhaps it's possible for people to think about education in this as well. Um, what is the one thing that you would wish to happen to center gender issues in the climate discussion? 
Um, and what is one thing that you, as in the panelists or anybody else, could do tomorrow for act to act for gender and climate justice? Anybody who wants to take on these very simple questions first is free to raise their hand. <laughs> Fiona Marker. Yeah, thanks. Um, what I would like us to do is to finally respect indigenous peoples and especially indigenous women's rights, because not only are they the most effective, but also the most effective. They are the frontline defenders of nature and thus humanity. And if we finally respect indigenous people's rights and especially indigenous women's rights and accept their leadership and, and center indigenous responses, then I believe we will have done a big step towards justice, climate justice and gender equality. And what I would, I would well recommend or like everyone to do, um, what, what I can do is, and, and that actually ties uh, in with much education, is to be brave and question everything that uh, you read, that you get told and um, question, especially when people say this is like the baseline of everything that we have built on, um, such as uh, I mentioned the, the enlightenment philosophy and everything, just question everything and then come to your own conclusion. And yeah. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie Akuma. I think that for, if there's one thing, I would say representation based on my experiences here in my part of the world. So continuing from what Fiona is saying, indigenous people, yes, people of color, yes, women that are vulnerable, yes, persons with disability, yes. There are so many of us, so many diverse um, a scope of women all over the world that needs to be represented. I realize that most of the time when we're having discussions in the global south, it's also centered in the global south. We're having discussions in the global north, it's also centered in the global north. So I actually have to give a lot of credit to Susanna and Dimitri for being able to include the global south in this conversation to make it quite equitable. That's a very good start, a place to be able to have equitable conversation that includes all parties. So representation is important for us. Our voices from everywhere needs to be held. Women holding other women's hands to come up because honestly, there are places that certain women can get to that others cannot. So the recommendation on those sides, I know there's, there's not one single thing that we need to do to resolve this interconnected problem, but there's a, a, a host of things that we can do together. If we collaborate, if we, if we are able to correlate and condition these things very well, we'll be able to do better. That is my one or plus more things that we can do to add to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Dr. Arahalo. Thank you very much. Uh, well, as an academic, I, I would like to say that academia is facing increasingly the challenge of understanding this complexity and uncertainty concealed within engineering, economic, and policy-oriented solutions. So, but we are not doing this at the rapid pace as is required. I have the feeling that we are answering uh, questions that were posed yesterday, and our answers take too much time to respond. And in this context, I would like that academia itself, but also funding uh, organizations take this into account. Reality complexity changes very fast. So the academic grid, the, fund, the, the funds, they, they, they must really also, let's say, hurry up a bit. We are in a climate emergency, you know? so we cannot go behind questions. We have to give answers that according to the current challenges. So that I wish for academia and something that I could do uh, from my humble position, let's say, is really to mm, do what we are doing at, 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 at this gender group and uh, uh, personally, that is uh, promoting in the students this critical thinking, this critical way of looking at reality in a holistic way and in a critical manner from their own social and cultural positions, valuing also the positions of others. No? That's, that would be my take on, on this question. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Zauter? 
Um, well, against my backdrop of, of UN women, I would say empower women and girls. Empower girls when, when wherever you see them and tell them that they can be anything they like, that they don't even question the possibility of studying a STEM subject of becoming a leader. The second would be take men on board. You probably all know the He For She campaign um, by UN women. It's extremely important that we take that other half of the population on board. If we don't, it's not going to work. And the third is become active. So from my point of view, of course, support UN women, become a member, become a friend, join, create a local group. Doesn't need to be UN women, can be anybody else, can be a local group, a national group, an international group, but um, do something with everybody else together. I think that's my contribution here. Yeah, we're hearing a lot um, about con um, cooperation and uplifting each other, which is which is really is really nice to hear. Um, Mayor Derna. Sorry, your, your microphone's off. Sorry. <laughs> As a mayor, what uh, can I do uh, to start tomorrow um, to bring um, climate justice and um, gender equality together, I would uh, uh, address uh, public transport and mobility issues because a clean, green eco-mobility is a very important aspect of our transition to climate neutrality. And I already mentioned the process the Bond for Future. And within this process, I will make sure that the needs and the contributions of women are well represented in our future mobility concepts and infrastructure. Also in Bonn, it is the case that the majority of people who use public transport, transport are women. So this is, of course, a gender related issue. And uh, in Bonn, for example, we just started uh, with the expansion of bicycle lanes and we continue with safe mobility and a look on the different mobilities needed. And also within this very important issues and topics, we need a gender view and um, that is my contribution. Uh, and I will not start it tomorrow. I already started in, in Bonn in our city. That's a really interesting point to share. Um, there's a lot of research and writing about how cities are actually designed um, for men and male transport. So that's that's a really good point. Thank you very much. Um, Ina Parvanova. Uh, thank you, Amanda. I just wanted to say uh, something that um, I tried to explain earlier about that interlinkage. And it was really great to hear um, that in all the wishes that everyone is sharing, um, everyone spoke of uh, multiple um, factors that are all uh, interlinked. And so what I would wish for is that understanding of those links to be accelerated, to be better. Um, and and in, in closing, I just wanted to say that it's really encouraging that the connections between uh, gender and, and um, women and girls empowerment and effective climate policy and action are being made in many more places than even two or three years ago. But that needs to be accelerated if we are to have any chance of uh, meeting the 1.5 degree goal. And we must do everything in our power. And this is my pledge as well. We'll keep doing what we're doing because we need to ensure that the 1.5 goal is you know, reached to preserve the lives and cultures of population in low-lying islands um, and those exposed to the most severe climate impacts. Um, achieving gender equality and the climate goals are mutually reinforcing. We can and we must do this. Thank you very much. Um, and that is a great closing statement for us to have. Um, thank you very much to everybody who joined. Uh, we're really thrilled that there was such a wide audience interest in this topic. Um, and thank you very much to the panelists as well for sharing your knowledge and experience. It is really incredibly heartening to have these discussions and to know you are all working in this space, um, especially as somebody who is working on um, climate news every day. Um, so the recording of this panel will be available um, early next week and you can find it by following the links that we will post in the chat. It will be on YouTube. 
Um, I hope everybody has a really lovely rest of your evening and um, weekend as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.